Good evening, everyone. And welcome to this uh, Facebook Live presentation. I want to introduce to you first the Brazoria County Master Gardener Association and how much we enjoy our partnership with Keep Pearland Beautiful. The Brazoria County Master Gardener Association is a volunteer service program uh, through the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. And our Master Gardener group in Brazoria County provides education and outreach to our Brazoria County commu community. We love to work with gardeners in the local area to help you understand um, what types of plants and what types of crops grow best in Brazoria County and answer your questions and help you help you with solving your uh, gardening problems. Well, here we are in, um, in July. We're in the middle of hurricane season. Uh, we've been lucky so far, but as we uh, near the end of the season, of course, that increases the chances of a hurricane. And um, we are happy to have with us today, Kimberly Mayer, our uh, horticulture agent for the uh, Brazoria County AgriLife Extension. And uh, Kimberly's gonna talk to us about lawn care tips uh, to keep your um, uh, lawn, um, uh, to prepare your lawn and um, uh, keep your lawn green. And as she says, she wants your neighbors to be green with envy. Uh, when they're looking at your landscape and your lawn. So um, it was just a few minutes after seven, we're going to go ahead and get started. And I'm going to turn the presentation over to Kimberly. Welcome, Kimberly. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I just want to say howdy and welcome to this Keep Pearland Beautiful Garden Lecture for lawn care tips to make your neighbors green with envy. I am delighted to have been invited here tonight to speak. Uh, like Joanne said, my name is Kimberly Mayer and I am the horticulture agent for Brazoria County. My job is to oversee the Brazoria County Master Gardeners and to provide educational outreach events on all things horticulture related. So after this lecture, if you'd like to learn more about a certain topic, whether it's anything from trees to turf to tomatoes or anything in between, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll have my email and contact information um, on the last slide and I'm, I'm happy to, to help and, and look forward to hearing from you. The other uh, part of my job is to take calls and emails from the public and find answers to their questions. When it comes to turf, I take several calls a week from the public um, on, on different problems and, and concerns that they have about their lawn, whether it's brown patches in their yard or what they should do about weeds. I get asked all the time how they can fix it. So let's dive in and talk about some ways that you can have a healthy green lawn. So what I have noticed about being a horticulture agent and answering questions from the public is that people are either really, really passionate about their lawns and they go the extra mile to make sure that they are healthy and dense and green, or they are the exact opposite and really couldn't care less about what their lawn looks like. Well, I wanna introduce you to my sweet mama who at 70 years young, is the one who mows and weed eats and waters her lawn uh, at her house. You could even see those, um, those beautiful pine trees in the background on the picture. She takes real good care of those as well. And so I can, can't tell you how happy she was when she found out that I got this job with Texas A&M. So now she has a direct line to all her turf grass questions. So this presentation is for her and for all the other fans of lawn care. And maybe out there tonight, there's just one person listening or watching who we can convert uh, to really having a, a love for their grass and their lawn. So let's dive in. Lawns and your turf, they can seem difficult to keep healthy in our urban environments. We've got hot, drought-prone summers and our 
um, alkaline and heavy clay soils um, are, are tough. But there are some simple ways in which you can boost your lawn's health and avoid the problems with diseases and pests that seem to be common in our area. So your best defense to a lawn that will make your neighbors green with envy is a good offense. Most people want to know the easiest way to keep weeds and disease from their lawn. And I always, always tell them that they need to adhere to good cultural practices. And that includes frequent mowing, fertilization, and watering. If you take the time to do these three things properly on the back end, you'll have a much easier time when it comes to dealing with weeds or disease or pests in your lawn. And it really is as simple as that. Those three things will give you the best defense against the problems that might pop up in your lawn. A dense, healthy turf, one that is thick with healthy plant material, is not going to allow those weed seeds to penetrate down to the soil and make contact, and so they won't be able to germinate. And that just creates less weeds and less headache for you. So let's start with mowing. Here are some practical tips and best practices for mowing. You'll want to mow often enough to remove about one third of the leaf blade when you cut the turf. Sometimes in the summer months, this means mowing twice a week. You want to leave the clippings to fall into the turf because those clippings will decompose relatively quickly in the warm, moist conditions at the soil surface. And what that does is release nutrients back into the soil to feed the turf. So there are about four different types of um, grass that do well in our area. Uh, I would venture to guess that most of you um, have St. Augustine. St. Augustine is a shade grass. And so in order to get enough light to photosynthesize, it needs to have long, wide blades that are kept cut at about three and a half inches in height. So what that means is you let the St. Augustine grow to four inches and cut it back to, to three and a half. If it's cut too short, it can't make its own food and will stress out. And instead of growing uh, healthy plant material and more grass blades, you'll get more runners. So um, a Bermuda grass, that likes to be kept mowed low at about one and a half inches, depending on your variety. When Bermuda grass is not mowed low frequently, it gets leggy and less dense. <clears throat> now, some of you may uh, or may not have um, buffalo grass. That likes to be left alone or kept high at about uh, four, four inches. <laughs> Excuse me. One sure way of killing St. Augustine is to grow it in full sun and mow it low. You don't want, you definitely don't want to scalp your St. Augustine. So if you don't like um, the look of St. Augustine, it would really, it would be better just to try a different turf grass. Um, each of the four turf grasses that grow well in our area have widely different growing needs. So they are not really interchangeable. If you have a lot of shade, you'll need St. Augustine. If you have a combination of sun and shade, then zoysia grass will be a better fit for your needs. If you have full sun, you can grow Bermuda grass or buffalo grass, which are both drought tolerant, but only Bermuda grass will tolerate a lot of walking on it. If you want a low mown grass, go with Bermuda grass. If you want a grass that needs no maintenance once established, then buffalo grass is for you. If you have the right grass in the right spot, you'll have a lawn that thrives. But if you try to grow grass in conditions it does not like, then unfortunately, it's just always going to look stressed. So we talked briefly about um, uh, mulching or recycling those uh, turf grass clippings and letting them um, lay in the grass. Uh, it can really be beneficial to mulch or recycle uh, those clippings that are generated from mowing. Turf grass clippings are usually between 2 and 4% nitrogen, 
uh, and they can really reduce the need for supplemental nitrogen fertilizers and uh, really almost up, up to half. So it saves, saves you money down the road um, if you just leave those grass clippings on the, on the lawn. Um, they should, those uh, mulched or recycled clippings should be evenly dispersed across an area. Uh, really try and avoid uh, big pilings of, of clippings um, that, acu that accumulate. You want it spread evenly. Um, otherwise it can, it can damage the underlying turf by restricting the sun and water that gets to it. Um, and then, you know, of course, um, be a good neighbor, be a good steward of a steward of the environment, and um, it, don't leave your grass clippings um, to to uh, wash down the storm drains or other uh, water sources. Um, you know, don't leave them on the sidewalks and the streets to as debris. Sweep them or, or blow the clippings back into the turf. Now, um, some of you might be asking, well, what should I do if I've got, got weeds? Should I still um, uh, recycle those clippings? So if you are concerned um, about weeds, you wanna avoid mulching the, the clippings that might contain, might contain um, seed heads or, or any other reproductive um, plant material in there. They could possibly spread across a, a wider area. So um, you could definitely consider bagging and removing the clippings during that part of the growth stage. And remember, we talked about the mowing frequency should be based on that one third rule, so that no more than one third of the total above ground green vegetation be removed at any time. And that will help to prevent that scalping that is so stressful to the turf grass and, um, and can really introduce pest problems, including weeds, um, to, your, to your turf. So um, also if you're mowing and you're concerned that you might have disease or insects in a certain area, you'll wanna try and avoid mowing in that area, in that affected area. Um, and consider cleaning your mower blades in between mowings. Um, also, you know, if you feel like you have a disease, some type of uh, disease in your lawn, um, you might want a, a bag and remove those clippings until you've resolved the problem. And then lastly, you want to avoid mowing when the grass is moist or damp. This can sometimes increase the risk of spreading disease, and that can cause your clippings to clump up rather than disperse evenly, like we talked about. Um, Joanne, if there are any questions or comments, um, feel free to, to jump in. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions as I go along, or we can save them to the end, whatever works. So um, I just wanted to make one last point about mowing, and that is to sharpen your blades often. When you cut your lawn with dull blades, it rips the top of the blade, as you can see from, from the comparison photo. It, it drastically affects the look of your lawn. The lawn on the left that was cut with a sharp blade is green and healthy, and the lawn on the right that was cut with a dull blade looks stressed and unhealthy. And this makes the plant very susceptible to pests and disease. So it really is important to properly maintain any equipment that you use to manage a turf grass area. Dull mower blades just will not cut the grass properly and it can cause injury to the leaf blade, uh, whether it's crushing or shedding or leaving jagged uneven cuts on the, on the leaf blades. Uh, and, and again, it, all that does is increase your Turf, grass, turf grasses susceptibility to pests and disease and other environmental stresses such as drought or extreme heat like we're, like we're suffering with now. So your mower blades um, can be sharpened at home or you can have them done professionally. Of course, you wanna use extreme caution when sharpening those mower blades to avoid the risk of in injury. Um, you always wanna turn those mowers off and remove the spark plug prior to any type of maintenance. Dirty or contaminated mower blades can also increase the likelihood of spreading some, type, some types of turf diseases, 
and can physically disperse turf grass pests, um, disease, and insects. So when mowing multiple areas with different pest populations, you want to take steps to really adequately clean that equipment so that you prevent contamination across those uh, different sites or different areas. You can use um, your, your water hose, um, a scrub, a scrub brush, and some dish soap uh, that can be very beneficial in cleaning the mower blades. And really your objective is to remove any grass clippings or other debris uh, from the blades and the other crevices on the, on the mower deck. Um, and then make sure that those blades are, have dried completely before you put that mower back into storage or the garage or, or a shed. Um, and that's, um, those are just some, some, some great tips to, to use on your, for your lawn mower. So let's move on to fertilization. You'll want to fertilize your turf grass um, lightly and only when the grass needs it. In our climate and soils, heavy applications of a high nitrogen fertilizer can do damage to turf grass by attracting insects that feed on the lawn. Uh, it can burn the lawn with high levels of mineral salts. And um, if, you, or if you're forcing a really heavy flush of growth uh, by using that nitrogen, high nitrogen fertilizer, that can lead to fungal diseases as well. Um, so the weed and feed type products um, that you see out there, um, I'm going to tell you to just say no to those weed and feed uh, products because that can really stress your turf grass, especially St. Augustine. Um, it can also damage tree roots. So if you are using um, those weed and feed type products around your trees, especially your young trees, they can be harmed um, by um, herbicides and, um, and that are included in some of those weed and feed products. Um, if you think about it, your mature tree roots extend far beyond the drip line of the tree. And so if you have a tree anywhere in the yard, its roots could definitely be affected by what you're applying to the lawn. And um, besides all of that, the time to apply pre-emergent um, herbicides to kill weeds here is in late winter. And then the time to fertilize is not until we are well into the spring. So really the, the two of those should not be applied at the same time in a single product. One will just go to waste. And so again, um, just say no to those, those weed and feed products. Um, and uh, like you've heard me say, I'll, I'll preach it again, Leaving those grass clippings on the lawn when you mow is really the best way to fertilize during the growing season. Those leaf blades contain all the nutrients that the grass needs and the clippings filter pretty quickly out of sight to the soil surface. And it's there that they decompose and return nutrients to the roots. Um, in the spring, when the grass has come out of dormancy and is actively growing, uh, and what that means is that you've had to start mowing it. That is when you want to apply a light fertilizer of about half a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. Or you can just do a top dressing um, of a really good high quality compost. Going light on the fertilizer will keep your lawn from getting damaged from over application, but it will still provide enough nutrients to get it growing well. If your lawn is not doing well, look for ways to improve soil depth and drainage. Change the mowing height to match the needs of your lawn. Remember what we talked about at, at the beginning. Uh, check your watering time. Check those sprinklers, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. Um, and if, you're, if you need to aerate, if your ground is hard, then that may be something that you want to look into as well. What you don't want to do is try to fix a problem by adding more fertilizer because you will just add stress um, on the lawn uh, and, and make it look worse. So an important thing to remember is that fertilizer is not plant food per se. It's merely the nutrients that the grass uses to make leaf blades so it can photosynthesize and make its own real food. 
following these step, these simple steps will help keep your lawn healthy throughout the year and it will reduce the need for chemical pesticides. So you'll want to start this uh, about one month after what we call complete green up in spring, which is usually mid to late April into the first part of May. Um, and then you'll want to um, consider a light fertilization about every four to eight weeks throughout the growing season. So a good way to remember that is to do it on a major holiday. So think about um, a light fertilization on Memorial Day, Independence Day, and then Labor Day. And then once you get into um, winter, when, you know, just before your lawn starts to go dormant, you can top dress, uh, top dress your lawn with a high quality compost, uh, which will also help improve your, your soil profile. Hey, Kimberly. Yes. Um, uh, two, two things here. We have a question and, and also um, I just wanted to pause for a second because this is really important. I think a lot of the lawn services and landscaping services, and it's probably efficiency on their side. Um, I know that they, they recommend um, uh, coming through and doing the pre-emergent and fertilizer at the same time. It's probably just efficient for them. And so I just wanted to make sure that uh, what you said was so important and I hadn't really thought about it. Uh, if I understand correctly, pre-emergent, that's something that you would apply in the winter? Uh, you're talking about a, a pre-emergent um, her herbicide? Yeah. Um, so we, um, I'm actually going to um, get to that a little bit later in, the, um, in my weed section. Um, okay. but if, um, if so, if I, if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, you're saying that the local lawn care companies, um, often fertilize and put out a pre-emergent at the same time. Is that what I'm I, I, I know I just, just from experience that sometimes that's what they suggest. And I'm guessing it may be more for efficiency purposes, right? To well, say probably, probably so, yes, because we'll we'll talk about that again um, in the next few slides when I uh, when I get to uh, the weed section on pre-emergence, and I may be able to answer your question better in, in that section. But um, it, as long as the 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 timing is correct, um, as long as your you don't want to fertilize until your lawn is actively growing. Um, one thing I like to tell people is that you know really you should have mowed your lawn at least twice um, before you um, before you fertilize. Um, and that's just kind of a something to something to to remember and to you know help help it help it, help it go easier. Uh, oh, but I, I, you know as long as the timing is right, I don't I don't think doing those two type two things um, at the same time um, is is too big of a problem. Okay. And we do have a question in the chat. I um, someone is saying that in the past they've used Scott's weed and feed for several years. Um, and so they hear, hear what you're saying about, uh, uh, discouraging the use of weed and feed and wanted to know if there was any particular products or brands that are recommended to use instead for weed control and for fertilizer. So what I would share is that, um, as an AgriLife employee, um, I, really am, am, should not recommend or um, certain products. Uh, in the weed section, uh, when I get to it, we uh, definitely give you some uh, different active ingredients to look for and, the, and some trade names. Um, but as far as fertilizer, what I would say is, um, personally, I, I would try and stay away from the large box stores and, and um, those, uh, synthetic type of fertilizers and really go for a uh, an organic slow release fertilizer for your lawn. Um, what I can suggest would be um, something like um, uh, Microlife or Nitrofoss. Um, those are um, really great products that you can get at your local hardware store or tractor supply, your kind of your mom and pop type stores. Um, that's what I would recommend as far as um, fertilization. 
And then um, if you'll just stay tuned for a couple more slides, I can share some uh, some more information with you on um, on products for weeds. But I, I, I do really stress not to use the weed and feed um, products. Um, a lot of those products contain something called atrazine. And that atrazine is what really can um, get into uh, not only our our water streams, but our trees as well, and can really cause damage and stress and, and possibly the decline of your tree. So I really would uh, stay away from the, the weed and feed products. Any other questions, Joanne? No, nope, thank you. Uh-huh, you're welcome. All right, so, um, so you might be asking now, how do I know if I need to fertilize my lawn? Um, the best way to determine whether your lawn requires additional plant nutrients is to have the soil tested. Soil tests uh, determine the amount of nutrients that are available in the soil for plant use. The soil test also determines soil pH, and that, that just means whether the soil is acidic or alkaline. And um, and that pH can affect your soil nutrients of availability and, and what the soil is able to, to take up. Your soil test report will help you understand which nutrients your soil lacks and which ones are present already in adequate amounts. The test results will include recommendations on the amount of plant nutrients that would benefit your lawn. These soil tests are easy, they're inexpensive, um, the forms and the instructions are available through, uh, through me, through your, county, your local county extension office. They are also on um, the Texas A&M Soil Testing Laboratory website. And um, I actually have that um, website on, a, on another um, slide, which we'll get to. Um, so I'll, I will be able to put that in the chat for you once we get there. But once you know what your soil lacks, you'll need to figure out what kind and how much fertilizer to buy and apply. And so to do that, you need to know the size of your lawn. Many people do not know the size of their lawns. You know, you get to the, to the garden center to, to buy that fertilizer and realize, oh gosh, how big is my yard? Um, and so that can really lead to misapplication and inconsistent results. And so knowing um, how, 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 many square, um, how many square feet your lawn is, um, is important because those lawn care products are often recommended in amounts and they tell you to apply a certain amount per thousand square feet of lawn area. So in order to, to figure that out, to calculate the size of your lawn, uh, you can divide your lawn into sections and measure each section in feet. So for square or rectangular sections, you multiply length times width to determine the area in square feet. Um, and then you wanna add up all those sections and you'll arrive at the total size of your lawn. And the good news is that you'll need to um, measure only once and then you can use that calculation each time you visit the, the garden center. So knowing the size of your lawn and the results of your soil test will help you determine the correct amount of fertilizer or pesticide that you need to buy and apply. Your goal in applying um, any lawn care product uh, should be to apply measured amounts to measured lawn areas. So once you know your, what your soil needs and how big your lawn is, you can then select a fertilizer that will give the grass uh, the nutrients it requires and to calculate the number, uh, the amount of fertilizer that you need to buy. So um, on your screen there uh, is soiltesting.pamu.edu forward slash calc or C-A-L-C. And what that is is a fertilizer calculator that a &M has created. Um, so once you, that's what I would recommend using is that fertilizer calculator uh, that will help you make the most concise um, calculations uh, for your lawn. 
All right, let's move on to watering. So ideally, you want to water about one inch per week in the absence of rain. But what does that mean? So let's dive into that for a second. When the purpose of watering is to train your grass roots to grow down deep into the soil by watering one inch a week. If your turf grass is watered too frequently and only a little at a time, what happens is, is the moisture stays in the upper one or two inches of soil uh, and that's where the roots stay. But then in the heat of summer, that top two inches of soil dries out very quickly, leaving the roots literally high and dry, even if you watered that day. So the trick is to water deeply and infrequently. And that puts moisture into the lower part of your soil profile. And when the upper few inches dry out over the course of the week, the roots grow deeper to access the moisture that's still there at the bottom. So when summertime comes, like we are now in the thick of it, the roots are happy and so are you. So one way to test your irrigation system to check how long it takes to put one inch of water on your lawn, you can put out a, uh, a straight-sided can. We, uh, we like to use old tuna cans because they're exactly one inch deep. Um, and, then, uh, and then you'll time how long it takes, uh, turn that water on, time how long it takes for the water to reach the, the mark. We call this the catch can test. Uh, like I said, you can use old tuna cans if you'd like, or um, good old Amazon has um, these small little ra rain gauges that stick in the ground, uh, and they can help you measure the amount of water going into your lawn. So another uh, great thing to know, another great method um, is a cycle and soak. Now, this is a method of applying water to the landscape that drastically reduces, and in some cases, eliminates runoff. This method of applying water to the landscape is made up of multiple cycles for each station with a 30 to, min 30 to 60 minutes um, you know, a break for the water to soak into the soil between those cycles. So for example, the first cycle will break the surface tension of the soil and saturate the top layer of soil. The second cycle actually infiltrates the soil more efficiently and deeply after the first cycle. And then a third and sometimes a fourth cycle is beneficial if you've got a slope, um, if you've got a slope involved in your lawn somewhere, or if runoff occurs um, just after the sprinklers have run for just a few minutes. Uh, if that happens, you may it may be beneficial for you to have up to three to four different cycles. So, for example, if you've done the catch can test and you've determined that you need to run a sprinkler station for 12 minutes, schedule your controller to run the station two times for six minutes or three times for four minutes. And then again, if you've got a slope or you're seeing runoff, um, involved in that, then run the station four cycles for three minutes. So lots of um, controllers, uh, irrigation controllers, have the ability to have several different start times. Some controllers have up to four start times and within their multiple programs um, have the ability to have up to 16 uh, start times. Uh, each controller is different. Everyone's got kind of a different irrigation system. So um, look at, check out your instruction manual for your controller, for your irrigation uh, system and, um, and see what type of uh, cycles it offers. Uh, for the cycle and soak method to be effective, you want to set multiple start times with short run times for each station. And, you know, just take some time, take a few minutes to determine just how long each zone can run before runoff occurs. Um, think, you know, think about it. Every zone of your yard uh, might be slightly different. So spend a little time 
testing each zone and calculate the maximum amount, amount of minutes that the zone may run until you see runoff. Um, let's see. Some um, new irrigation controllers actually have a cycle and soak setting. Um, so for those controllers, you just set the maximum runtime for each station and a number of cycles. And the controller will automatically divide the runtime into the number of cycles uh, that you set. Now, if your controller doesn't do this, doesn't have multiple start times, you may want to think about upgrading to a new controller. Um, the replacement cost uh, could be is quickly returned in, in your water savings. And so um, another great way to figure out how much to water your lawn is to get the Water My Yard app. There's an app and there's uh, also a, a website. Um, this, um, this Water My Yard app can be found on the App Store or Google Play. And what this does is takes the guesswork out of knowing when and how much to water. Uh, the Water My Yard program, what it does is uses local weather data in sponsored areas to provide free weekly watering advice. This data is then collected from uh, an extensive network of weather stations and rain gauges, and along with a research-based understanding of plant water needs, it allows experts to send you customized weekly water advice for your specific lawn and irrigation. Uh, this is a free program. It's offered in parts of Texas. Um, and uh, you can definitely go to their website and um, check it out. You can download the app. This is an app that was um, created by Texas A&M AgriLife Extension by people that are much smarter than me. Um, but you can either, like I said, go online to their website or download the app, create an account and answer a few questions about your irrigation system. And then the Water My Yard program will send you, so you can either send you push notifications on your phone, or if you'd rather receive emails, um, you can do that too. And what it does is send you watering advice on how long to run your irrigation system. So for example, I got a notice on um, in my email, my inbox today that said, for this week, uh, we, we live in Richwood. For this week in Richwood, um, I'm gonna need to set a runtime of about 61 minutes. So obviously we haven't received any rain in Richwood for quite some time, um, but it really is neat. It tells you uh, the runtime and then you can break that up in, in, into cycles and use the cycle and, and soak method. Um, because really um, it's, it's hot and our, and our lawns, do need some water, but um, you don't want to over water or apply water um, at the wrong time. So this 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 tool works great to make sure that um, any water lost by your plants and soil is replenished, and it gives you those watering recommendations. Now, it can't predict future rainfall events, so you may still receive a recommendation to run your irrigation system when rain is in the local forecast. So if that happens, just you know, take a wait and see approach and, and consider letting mother nature do the, do the watering for you. Um, once you get in there and, and kind of play around with the app, it also uh, lets you adjust rainfall. Maybe, um, maybe you got a pop-up shower that, that wasn't forecast. Um, it lets you adjust that in there. So it's a, it's a really great tool to have. Water my yard. Kimberly, we've got another question. Yes. Okay, this one's from Shay Wilcoxon. So Shay's listening. Hi, Shay. And <laughs> she's asking a, a good question. I'm sure we've all thought about this and had different answers. When's the best time of day to water? So the best time of day to water is a first thing in the morning. Um, uh, you know, like a good four to 6 a.m before it gets hot. That way the water has time to um, penetrate down into your soil, um, you know, evaporate a little bit um, and, and uh, you know, take good care of your lawn. And then it, um, 
if you do it any later than that, it's just, um, you know, it's just too hot and that, that water gets evaporated up. If you do it too late in the evening, um, as it's getting dark, there's a chance that um, that could bring disease and pests to your lawn. So really uh, what AgriLife Extension uh, recommends is um, watering first thing in the morning, early, early in the morning. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or? No, it looks like we're on to pests. Okay. Um, so I still have, I'm um, looking at my, checking my time and um, making sure we stay on track. So I'm going to go through pests um, kind of quickly. Um, and so we're, we're going to talk about weeds here in a second. And while that, that while weeds are, are one of the biggest challenges to maintaining a, a neat, tidy, manicured lawn, insects can also be a problem too. So uh, white grubs, chinch bugs, and fire ants, those are the top three insect pests that are found in our lawns in this area. Fortunately, um, most of the other potential insect and mite problems of turf grass in Texas can be prevented or the damage minimized just by um, the, the three things that we've been talking about, and that's regular watering, appropriate fertilization, and frequent mowing. So um, just so that I make sure that I get through all my slides, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of push through here, but if you um, think that you have problems in your lawn with whether it's um, white grubs, chinch bugs, fire ants, things like that, um, you can definitely reach out to me. I'm, I'm happy to, to email you some great publications and um, information on, on biological controls, on chemical controls. If you, you know, if you really have a, a tough infestation, it may come to um, some type of chemical control that you need. But just for the sake of time, we're going to keep on moving. But like I said, if, if that's something that um, it's a problem in your lawn, just please um, shoot me an email and I'm, I'm happy to, to help with that. Um, so ants, the primary ant pest in Texas turf is the red imported fire ants. I'm sure we're all familiar with that. Um, whether you've been where we have a mound in your yard or you've been stung or bitten, um, those red imported fire ants are, are Texas tough, aren't they? Uh, there's some other ant species like the Texas leaf cutting ants and the raspberry crazy ant that can also affect turf grass areas. Um, but the ones um, in, in our area, the, these fire ants don't typically damage turf directly, but their mounds, uh, of course, can be very unattractive. It can, can kind of hinder your mowing operations and smother the grass. Um, and of course, uh, there's a potential hazard to people and pets because the those ants, I'm sure we all know, can uh, inflict a, a really painful bite and sting. So we've come to weeds. <laughs> uh, besides insects and disease in your lawn, weeds could also be, you know, just a whole presentation in itself. But again, since we're kind of limited on time, I'm just going to kind of talk about them in a broad sense. There are different types of weeds, and when you're treating them, they need to be need to be treated with different cultural and chemical controls. So, so where do you begin? So the first thing you want to do is you want to properly um, identify the, the weed that you're dealing with in your lawn. Uh, you also want to know um, what type of turf grass species uh, that you're dealing with as well because when you're selecting an herbicide for your turf, for these weeds in your turf grass, um, they're not all the same. And some herbicides can actually um, affect certain turf grasses. So um, you, you wanna make sure that you've identified the weed properly and that you know exactly what type of um, turf grass that you're dealing with. And then you also wanna determine whether um, whether you want to use a pre-emergent or a post-emergent product and you know which one is appropriate. Um, pre-emergent and post-emergent herbicides are applied at different points in the weed's life cycle. 
So before purchasing a product, it's really essential to know which type of product to select uh, for the applicant for the timing of the application. Um, in some cases, it may be appropriate to purchase products containing both pre and post emergent herbicides. In some cases, there may be um, just dozens of unique weed species um, in your landscape. Now, I will um, confess to you <laughs> as your local horticulture agent that um, earlier this spring, my lawn, my landscape was one of those um, yards that had uh, several different types of weed species present. And so um, don't feel overwhelmed. What you want to do, uh, it, it happens, it happens to, you know, the best of us. You want to focus on identifying um, kind of what the general trends are and the types of weeds that you have in your lawn. Are they mostly broadleaf weeds or grassy leaves? Um, so you, you need to have a general idea of what you're dealing with to help you select the most uh, effective product for your situation. Um, let's see here. Um, so pre-emergent herbicides are products that are designed to prevent seedling emergence and development. They are best applied before seed germination. So for this reason, these products are most effective on um, annual weeds. Uh, in Texas, these products are typically applied to lawns twice a year, once in the spring and again in the fall. In the spring, pre-emergent herbicides are often applied when the soil temperatures are between 50 and 55 degrees. And this is the soil temperature range in which um, several summer annual weeds, including crabgrass, begin to germinate. Um, this temperature is usually reached between mid-February and mid-March. Um, so again, like we talked about earlier, that application um, timing is, is very important. For fall application, uh, it can be a little bit more difficult to pinpoint and will kind of vary from year to year. But in general, most fall pre-emergent applications are made between late August and October. Um, now, you do want to avoid using um, broadleaf emergent weed control, especially during the really hot days of summer. Once it gets above 85 degrees, um, it's, it's just too hot. It can really damage, damage your lawn. So um, post-emergent herbicides are generally gonna be much more effective when they're applied earlier in a, in a weed's life cycle. As the weed matures and grows, the product uptake and movement within the weed becomes more limited. So it's important to really kind of judiciously look for those new weeds during that transition period between spring and summer and fall. And um, it, you know, in some cases, it, like I talked about, it may be appropriate to apply both pre and post emergent herbicides um, simultaneously for, for best results. That's, you know, I, I confess to you that I had lots of those, uh, very, a variety of weeds in my lawn early this spring. And so um, that's what I did. Um, and so what I will tell you is that it's very important to read the label on those herbicide products products and make sure that um, you are using products that um, uh, won't damage your actual turf grass. So on the screen here, there are two websites. One is called domyown.com. Um, the other one's called lawndork.com. These are two really great websites, uh, not only to help you with, um, to help you find products for weed control, but also um, pest control as well. Really great websites, um, great search uh, search bars on there. Um, you can type in something like um, chinch bugs and it will um, kind of uh, pull up for you what type of, um, uh, what active ingredients, what particular products uh, do well um, against chinch bugs. You can type in things like um, dollar weed and it will offer up suggestions um, for chemicals that will take care of dollar weed in your lawn. So those are two really great websites that I would 
um, recommend. All right, um, moving along, um, let's talk about disease for just a second. Disease can be a factor in your lawn as well. And again, um, while I don't have the time to go into lots of details on disease, this chart is a great source of information to help troubleshoot or um, help you kind of diagnose the problems in your lawn. This is an earthwise guide to lawn problems. And it's really a, a foolproof way to, to work through the questions that you may have um, and, and follow your flow of answers. I will um, confess again that as a, as a fairly new horticulture agent, I've used this, um, this flow chart quite a lot when people have called or, or emailed uh, with questions. And um, let's see if my link will work. Are y'all able, to, Joanne, are y'all able to see that link or? N no, no, I don't think it's going to the right Not page. Work. Okay. Um, if, if you're interested, this is, comes, this is a several page uh, PDF. It's got lots of great information on disease. Um, when we were almost to the end of, end of the presentation, be sure to jot my um, email address down. I'm happy to, to email this to you. It's just a, a really great source of information and kind of will help point you in the right direction if you um, are struggling with things um, in your lawn. Um, and then one other thing I'd like to talk to mention about um, disease. Um, if your turf is, is suffering from drought or disease, something like take all root rod or soil compaction or things like that, um, if if your area doesn't respond to your best efforts to, to grow and, and, and come back, you might wanna consider sending in a sample to the state plant clinic for analysis. Um, that website is right there on your screen, plantclinic.tamu.edu. Um, you can also send your photos of your lawn to, to me, your local county extension agent, who can help you identify what might be going on with your lawn. Um, I can help you, you know, provide some troubleshooting and, and suggestions for your turf grass. I'm happy to help with that. And so um, one last thing, I know we talked about um, soil testing briefly, but I just wanted to share the soil testing um, website uh, right there on your screen, soiltesting.tamu.edu. Um, that really is important um, to know what your soil profile looks like. Soil testing on your lawn should be done about, you know, at least every two to three years. It's simple and it's a quick way to find out the levels of nutrients in your soil. We've got the forms and um, the sample bags here at our extension office. Um, if you're not in the Angleton area, you can go to this website and print out the form there um, and, and use, you know, just a, an acceptable, some other um, Ziploc bag or, or something that will keep all that, those soil samples together uh, and that will mail well. Um, just use, use your common sense there, but um, this is what your soil sample results will look like once you get them back. It takes about five to seven business days to get your uh, results back. Um, if you didn't know, all this testing is done at our lab in College Station. Um, and this is what you'll get back either by email or, um, or by snail mail, if that's what you prefer. But it will um, it, it give you all these results. Uh, and if you need help um, figuring out what the, the results say, um, or kind of understanding it, um, that's what I'm here for. I'm happy to to help you um, kind of maneuver through the results of your test. Um, and then you'll notice, hopefully you can see that on your screen, uh, the soil testing lab will give you, um, will recommend what level of, um, or how much fertilization uh, your lawn requires. For example, this particular soil uh, test, um, the soil is, is actually fairly healthy and really only needs about uh, a third of a pound of fertilizer in it. So they'll give you recommendations there um, and, and note any, any other specific things that you might 
need to know. Um, so with that, I will close out my presentation uh, and give you my contact information. It's on the screen. I know we covered quite a bit of information in a short amount of time. Turfgrass management really could, it could be a week long course because there is so much information out there to absorb. So if there's something that I didn't cover and you'd like to know more about it, um, I'm happy to take a few questions. Um, or if you'd rather email me or call me, you can do that as well. Um, my email address, phone number is there. You can also check out our website as well. Uh, but I wanna thank you so much for your attention tonight. And um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. And um, I'll, I'll leave you with that last screen of my, my sweet mama's beautiful yard that she takes such pride in. Hopefully there's somebody listening tonight that, um, that has decided that turf grass is exciting and, <laughs> and are ready to, to jump to it and take good care of their lawn. Uh, but that's all that I have for tonight, Joanne. Thank you. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have. And I think the biggest takeaway I have from this is that, um, you know, you hit the high points of the basic things that if we sure. do those things, uh, if we follow those instructions on watering and keeping on top of our uh, managing our weeds and mowing, yes. uh, then and fertilizing, then we really can um, maybe have a, a lawn as beautiful as your mom's. Absolutely. I agree. It's, it really is. It really is that simple. <laughs> Well, thank you, Kimberly, very much. We appreciate it. And we appreciate everybody who joined us this evening for the presentation. All righty. Sounds good. Thank you. Keep Pearland beautiful. And thank you, Joanne. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm.